Hi everyone, this is ninth episode of Range of Science. Today our guest is uh, Julian Barbour, uh, great contrari contrarian of uh, theoretical physics in both in terms of his uh, content of his work and the lifestyle. Uh, his work requires uh, some uh, significant revisions of our uh, view of cosmology and the uh, ultimate reality. And also uh, he's uh, opposed to um, uh, conveyor like nature of modern academic system which uh, publish or perish attitude uh, which is why he's uh, since uh, his phd in uh, about general relativity in the uh, 60s uh, he has not held the uh, academic uh, post but works uh, by himself uh, and we're going to discuss today uh, his latest book janus point uh, uh, thank you for coming julian uh, it's a pleasure my first question, um, I would like to start with just uh, briefly explaining, introducing the uh, concept of arrow of time. Uh, what kind of arrows are, are there and uh, how it's uh, related to second law of thermodynamics? The, the most, well, I suppose the, the most obvious arrow of time is, is the one that we all directly experience. We, we all have the feeling that time is passing. We, we have memories of what we did. We don't have memories of the future. Um, at, a, at a sort of physical level, we all get older in the same direction. We never meet anybody who's getting younger. And this is a very widespread fact throughout the whole of the universe because uh, astronomers now understand the way stars evolve and how they get older. And they're all getting older in the same direction, exactly the same direction as we are. Um, and this has been a really, this basic fact has been a, a puzzle since uh, the discovery of the laws of thermodynamics in 1850, because the Newton's laws are what are said to be time reversal symmetric. They, they work equally well, whichever direction you assume that time is running. What that means more precisely is the following. Suppose you have particles which evolve from some initial condition uh, in accordance with Newton's laws, and then at some point you imagine that you could Im instantaneously reverse all the velocities of the particles, leaving their positions at that instant the same, then that would be the initial condition for a new set of, a, a new solution. And all that would happen is that the particles would trace their evolution backwards. They would just follow exactly the same tracks going in, in the backward direction. Um, so that's very different from a system in which, in which you have friction. If you have a ball, say, rolling on a sticky table, uh, the ball after a while will come to an end. Uh, its, its motion will come to an end, it, it, will, it will stop. So that's, that's a big difference. And it, it's a very basic feature of Newton's laws. And it applies to virtually all the known laws of nature with a couple of very small exceptions, which are important at the very earliest stages in the universe's history, but don't seem to be, don't really affect this, amazing arrow of time, the, the, the direction of time. So that's one arrow. Then there are various other arrows. There's, um, there's a very closely related one in uh, the behavior of electromagnetic waves. When you uh, have a TV antenna sending radio signals or TV signals, they all go out from the uh, antenna, they go out in, in spherical waves out into distant space, uh, you, you never find them coming back again uh, into the antenna. And the same phenomenon in a much more uh, visible way happens if you throw a stone into a still pond, uh, the, the stone lands in the pond, and then these beautiful concentric waves propagate outwards. Um, until they reach the edge of the pond, but you, you never see them coming back in again. So that's all, uh, that's one example. Then there's uh, 
there's all the ones to do. I've already partially mentioned that the fact that we have memories of, of what seems to be us, the past, and, and they all agree, they always agree pretty well, first of all, with your within your own consciousness, with your own memory, but also if you talk to your uh, friends and relations, by and large, they can agree on what happened yesterday. I mean, there are differences, but I think in almost all cases, you can say, you can understand why one disagrees, you, you've just forgotten or something like that. Um, so there's that's called the sort of the psychological arrow, and I've already mentioned something about it. Then in quantum mechanics, there's a, there's a thing which causes a lot of uh, disturb a lot of puzzlement, which is called collapse of the wave function. I don't really want to get into that because it's a, a technical issue, and um, I'm sure people who've uh, who've uh, taken any interest in quantum mechanics and Schrödinger's cat will will know all about this. Well, let me just mention the famous Schrödinger's cat. So you can, in quantum mechanics, in principle, though far from yet in practice. You can have a situation where a, a cat can be in a in a box, and maybe some poison has been let loose in the box, or it hasn't. And um, so there are two possibilities which coexist together; that they're there simultaneously. In in one situation, the cat is is dead, and the other, the cat is alive. And according to quantum mechanics, until you actually look to see what is the case. Um, you, uh, the theory says that both of those possibilities are there. The cat can be either dead or alive. And you can't really understand how quantum mechanics works unless you make that assumption. Then you actually open the lid and see whether the cat is alive or death, dead, and you find one, one of the possibilities, and that's called collapse of the wave function. And this causes endless discussions. I don't know how many papers have been published on this in the literature. So that's more or less a list of the main arrows of time. Uh, and uh, well, I should mention the one with which I'm particularly concerned in, uh, it, this is to, in thermodynamics and it's to do with what's called entropy. So entropy is defined, well, there are various definitions of entropy, but the most elementary, and basically people say it's a measure of disorder. So if you have a box, say in, in a room, and you start off and there's a block of ice in, in one corner of the box, uh, and the walls of the box are at the temperature of the room, uh, bit by bit the ice will melt and then the water that is formed will evaporate and after a while water molecules will fill the whole box and will be completely uniformly distributed and that's a unif that, that's a that's what's called an irreversible process um, in principle by the way I explained by at some stage if you could imagine that you could stop the velocities of all those particles and make them uh, turn around exactly, go back in the opposite direction, they would go back and form the block of ice. But um, that's never going to happen naturally. Uh, well, in principle, it can happen. But you have to wait for a very, very long time. So uh, and that growth of disorder that's spreading from the ordered crystalline state of the ice to all of the gas being spread out uniformly, that's called uh, the growth of entropy. So uh, that's what's normally thought by scientists to define the, be the most fundamental arrow of time. Uh, yes, according to uh, current uh, widely held consensus, the universe is heading towards heat test just uh, uh, because of uh, growth of entropy, which uh, is considered to be applied to cosmological, uh, cosmic scale, not just to uh, other aspects. And uh, you disagree with that and you call it in-box scenario, which is uh, correct for confined spaces, but not correct for uh, all universe. Could you uh, explain that uh, that more clearly? Uh, yes, I'll I'll do my best. Well, first of all, um, nothing in science is set in stone. All all theories in science are provisional, uh, and they have to be tested. Now, 
what my collaborators and I have shown is that there may be an explanation of the arrow of time, which is nothing to do with, with increase of entropy uh, or, or increase of disorder. And instead, actually, uh, the arrow of time is uh, corresponds to an increase in order. Now, there's... Um, so the first observation to make is that the laws of thermodynamics were discovered as a consequence of people studying how steam engines work. There was an absolutely marvelous book published in 1824 by a Frenchman called Sadi Carnot, where he uh, established certain fundamental facts about the maximum efficiency that a steam engine could have. And that then led in, uh, 26 years later, in 1850, to the discovery of the first two laws of thermodynamics by William Thompson, who later became Lord Kelvin, and perhaps more clearly and fundamentally by the German Rudolf Clausius. Um, now, uh, all of these, all of these early discussions, and then these law. So the the, the first law of thermodynamics just says that energy is conserved. That's, that's not a great, that, that, that sort of standard part of physics. Um, the more interesting thing was that you could define something called entropy. Um, there are many different ways. Uh, and the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy, when it's defined properly, cannot decrease and generally has a tendency to increase. And um, so in its simplest form, which was noted by Clausius, uh, heat does not flow spontaneously from a hotter body, from a colder body to a hotter body. It's always that the hotter body, uh, the, temp the heat from a hotter body will flow to the colder body. So if you're nice and warm and you go into a, you go outside into the cold air outside and it's freezing outside, you will lose heat to the, to the air outside. That's actually the, the most basic phenomenon that's behind the second law of thermodynamics. But all the theoretical discussion of, the second, of, of thermodynamics, in particular the second law, considered systems in a box what you have that like that block of ice that i talked about in a box that melts and a key thing there is that there's a box there because if the box weren't there and shall we say uh, well the ice would just evaporate and it would all get mixed up and disappear in the air and and you wouldn't have that same effect at all um so uh if it is in a box, you, you do get this very uniform distribution. All the differences in, in, in disappear, and that, that's called heat death, as you've already mentioned, Zaza. But the, um, I think it's very surprising that in 170 years of this discussion, virtually nobody, uh, before my collaborators and I questioned it, said, well, have people been forgetting the possibility that there might not be a box there at all? What, what if the whole universe is not in a box? So there's no doubt um, thermodynamics is definitely uh, very, it's a very secure science if it's applied under the proper conditions. Now, Einstein said that thermodynamics was the only theory of universal content of which he was convinced that, now this is the important thing, within the domain of applicability of its basic concepts will never be overthrown. So the question is, what are the conditions when under which the basic concepts of thermodynamics hold? Well, it was established in, in the first place for a steam engine, and the steam has to remain in the cylinder of the steam engine. If it escapes from the cylinder, the steam engine just stops. Uh, and you look at all, so then when uh, first Clausius and then the great um, James Clark Maxwell and Boltzmann and uh, others develop what's called statistical mechanics, this was the theory of trying to explain thermodynamic behavior by the motion of atoms and molecules, 
all these theoretical papers started off by assuming that they've got something like elastic balls that are bouncing around in a box and bounce elastically off the wall of the box. And under those conditions, you do find you start with a special condition with all the balls in one corner uh, moving around, and very soon they will be spread out uniformly. So those, I would say, are the conditions conditions under which the basic concepts of thermodynamics are valid. And amazingly, I think far too few people, including, I suspect, Einstein himself, have not really considered what are the conditions when the basic concepts hold. And I would say they definitely have got to be when the system is somehow or other confined. Now, the universe is expanding, um, and the present evidence is that it's actually, its expansion is even accelerating, it's getting faster. So that doesn't really look to me like a system that's in a box. So that's why I think things are, are different. So that's the background to, to what I said. So perhaps you want to come in with any queries or comments there, Zaza. Yeah, uh, your theory uh, has implications for cosmology. Like Big Bang should not be viewed some like some special low entropy point, uh, but and birth of the universe, but rather as a point on a timeline uh, uh, from which two universes uh, uh, develop. You develop, could yeah. say, uh, and yes. increasing, uh, growing complexity. Uh, so uh, what? Uh, uh, what could be considered theoretically as uh, evidence uh, in the future for this kind of cosmology? Well, uh, let, let me expand a little bit on, on, on the basic thing. What my collaborators and I proved in a paper which was published in 2014 is the following. First of all, we did not consider Einstein's great general theory of relativity but we considered a theory which in many ways is a very good approximation to it, which is Newton's theory of gravity, universal gravitation, uh, where you consider just point particles that are interacting in accordance with universal gravitation. And we exploited a fact which surprisingly has been known since 1772, so if you have a system, so first of all, if you have a finite number of particles, n particles uh, in, in space, that can be your model universe. It, it's, it's, a, it's a very decent model universe uh, with, in which gravity is working. And uh, it was shown in 1772 by the great French-Italian mathematician Lagrange that if the energy is not negative, so if the energy is either exactly zero, which is what you would expect for a, a universe to be really, uh, or if it's positive, then this, it's a very simple proof to, to prove a very uh, interesting and definite fact. So uh, if those conditions are satisfied, so there's a quantity called the moment of inertia, which measures the size of that universe. So you, you imagine you have a timeline in, in Newtonian terms where time is, is one direction is the past and one is the future. So what the result was that in the infinite past, the size of the system was infinitely great. And it comes down steadily, just getting ever smaller down to a minimum value where it has a finite value, and then it grows again to infinity, goes up to, to, to infinity. And that point of minimum size, uh, I call the Janus point, because that divides the complete solution, the complete timeline into two halves. And the Roman god Janus looks in two directions of time simultaneously. So that's why I call it the Janus point. And, uh, so that's a start. So that's quite interesting. Now, the, the interesting thing is that hitherto everybody had assumed to explain the arrow of time and, and what they assumed was the growth of entropy everywhere. The universe must have started with a very special low entropy state that could not be explained by the known laws of nature and must be added on. The famous physicist Richard Feynman said that explicitly. He said there must be a special condition in the past 
which you have to add to the known laws of nature. Now, what we were able to show is that there is an arrow of time which is there just because of the structure of Newtonian theory. And it's related to that U-shaped curve, but that U-shaped curve only describes the overall size of the system. Now there's another quantity which is closely related to the quantity from which the Newtonian forces of gravity are derived. Uh, and that quantity is a measure of how clustered or how varied the the particles are. So you can imagine just, uh, you can imagine looking at stars on the sky and you could imagine that the stars were distributed over the whole sky in a very uniform way. There would be sort of small clusters where the particles looked a bit closer to each other on the sky than elsewhere. But basically the whole sky would look very uniform. It could be, and then when you actually do look at the sky, you see there are clusters of stars on the sky where they cluster together. Now there's a quantity which is closely related to the quantity which gives rise to Newton's gravitational forces, which is a measure of that quantity. And we call it the complexity for rather obvious reasons. Uh, I mean, when you look at the night sky, the, the pattern of the constellations is quite complex. Uh, and uh, the ancients managed to see all sorts of mythical animals and, and creatures in, in the sky. Uh, so um, what you find is when, that, when the system in Newtonian theory is at that point of minimum size, around that region, that Janus point, the points, the gravitating particles are more uniformly distributed than anywhere else in either direction. And in fact, as you go away in either direction, they get more clustered and that quantity that we call the complexity grows. And moreover, it goes in a very special way. It doesn't get more disordered, it gets more clustered, but as it gets more clustered, those clusters start beginning to behave like galaxies which rotate and in particular, you very often get just two particles which form together and go around each other around their common center of mass in elliptical orbits like the ones that Kepler showed, the planets go around the sun. And we call those Kepler pairs. And those Kepler pairs, have a very, uh, they're very regular in their behavior. They are like clocks which tick every time they complete an orbit. Uh, and all of, say, this you could have thousands of these Kepler pairs forming and all of them are clocks that tick. Now the rate at which the clocks tick is not the same, but the ratio of the rates is the same. It's as if you have a clock that measures in minutes or in seconds. Uh, so as long as there's always the same ratio of 60 between minutes and seconds, those are good clocks. And moreover, the the, the, the length of the, uh, the major axis of the ellipse, that becomes a measuring rod, and there's also a fixed direction. So you get a tremendous development of order. So, in, so basically what you have is, when you're at that Janus point of minimum size in the Newtonian picture, the, the particles are more or less like a, a, a swarm of bees. It's sort of a uniform distribution and the bees all flying in different directions. But as you go out, the most incredible structure is created. And that's the exact opposite of increase of disorder. And it doesn't look anything like an increase of entropy. And this was the basis of our paper published in, in 2014. And it did attract really quite a lot of uh, interest. In fact, we won, a, we won a prize, I forget what its name is, but between the three of us, we won, won $10,000 for that paper. So that was quite useful. Um, so that's, so this suggests, so first of all, what it shows without any shadow of doubt is that you can get an arrow of time because those, that increase of complexity, that increase of order defines what we call bi-directional arrows of time that go away in opposite directions from the Janus point. And if you were, if there was anybody intelligent living in that universe, they've got to be on one side of the Janus point or the other, and they will just see a growth of order. They will see a direction of time, but they will see that the laws are still Newton's laws and are, what are, are time reversal symmetric. They, they could imagine turning all the velocities around and it would just go back to what they thought was their, their past. So that's 
one situation. That was the one we published in 2014. There's another situation which I think is potentially even more interesting is that you can there are situations in Newtonian theory which uh, are called total collisions. So this is when all the particles, it's very, it's, it, they're very rare, these solutions, but it can happen, where all of the particles manage to conspire together to collide all together at their common center of mass. So all the particles are together at their common center of mass. Now, when that happens, the shape of the system. So you have to distinguish between the size and the shape of a system. So just think of a triangle. A triangle has a size and it has a shape, but the shape is clearly a much more fundamental quantity than the size because you, you could have, let me hold up. Here's a triangle. Let me hold it up in front of you like this, you see. So I move it towards you. You can see the triangle is getting larger and smaller but its shape is not changing. And, and anybody looking at that say, well, of course, the, 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 the triangle is staying the same. It's just because I'm looking at it from a, a distance instead of close up. So the shape is what counts. So when you actually look at the shape that this, un this Newtonian universe has when it comes to a total collision, it actually becomes very uniform, that shape. I was talking about all the stars being very uniformly distributed over the sky as one possibility. Well, it's very much like that. So, uh, and, and you could say that if you're inside that universe, you can't see the overall size because that has to be some ruler outside the universe, which is measuring the size. So anybody who's inside that universe, all that they would see is how the separations between the particles relative to each other change. And as they would go, if they were able to experience going to that total collision, they wouldn't in any way see it happen as, as all the particles colliding with each other. What they would see is that all the separations become more or less the same. The distribution becomes very uniform. Now, because of this time reversal symmetry of Newton's law, instead of saying that as a total collision, you can see it as a total explosion, in which case it becomes a Newtonian Big Bang. So. In that case, the, the Newtonian model universe that I'm talking about starts off in the most uniform way it can, and then it behaves exactly like when I was talking about one side or other of that Janus point solution. It just gets more structured and you get the same story again with Kepler pairs forming and clusters forming and so forth. So that's actually, and frankly, it's a pretty good model of what the universe looks like as it's currently described by general relativity. The universe seems to have started very uniform with a very uniform temperature and then just got much more clustered. So I think there's a chance this is a, a decent model of this. This could be the way. And it's just showing that the whole idea that you and these are all solutions that come out of Newton's theory that they're, they're, they're not, I haven't added anything to, to Newton's theory. And in fact, there's, there's quite good reasons to suggest that it ought to be these total explosion solutions. Uh, we can talk about if you're interested. So yeah. this is, a, I think we have the potential to completely change the way people think about things. I will just add one more thing, that all that I've been saying about Newton's theory is extremely well known to all the specialist mathematicians who work on Newton's theory of, of gravity. It's called the n-body problem. N stands for a finite number of particles. Um, and th they're very familiar with it, but I don't think any of them are, are interested in the problem of where the arrow of time comes from. Now, the people who are very interested in where the arrow of time comes from, in my experience, they know nothing whatever about the Newtonian n-body problem. So I think it's just a case of two people who, 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 who just knew nothing about what the, uh, the other side was doing. Now, it so happened that for some different reason, I happened to be interested in both problems. And I knew this result of Lagrange from 1772 uh, uh, back in 1982, but it was 30 years before I realized that it might explain the arrow of time. So 
uh, even I, who did know about both sides of these things, because um, I was interested in the era of time, uh, didn't put two and two together. Um, uh, Spinoza had the concept of conatus, uh, innate ability of things to enhance themselves, and uh, it has been uh, revived by several uh, thinkers and philosophers uh, uh, in relation to how life uh, evolves. Uh, do you think uh, this notion is conceptually close to uh, growth of complexity and taxi uh, notion? And how to uh, define, uh, how do we define uh, complexity mathematically? Uh, the, the, uh, well, first of all, I think uh, it, there is a relationship. I'm not at all an expert on Spinoza and his notion of conatus, but I do, I do, I mean, it is widely said that Leibniz got some of his key ideas from uh, Spinoza. Um, uh, and particularly Leibniz is always talking about striving, of the universe striving to perfection. And that sounds to me very much like your account of Spinoza and Conata. So I, I think that that fits together. Now, um, let me, so the, the, um, the definition of what I call the complexity is, so first of all, the complexity has got to be a pure number. So it's got to be something that depends just on shape. And uh, to make life simple, I'll just suppose that the, um, all the particles have the same mass. So we're just talking about points in space. And I want something that tells me how clustered or how uniformly distributed they are. And it mustn't depend upon the size. It must be what's called scale invariant or, or a pure number. So that means you're going to have to have two lengths and they've got to be sort of democratically chosen lengths that involve all the particles. So there are two lengths. So, and then you take the ratio of those lengths and then you've got a pure number. So uh, one number, uh, which is a very fundamental number in, in the mathematics of points in space, is called the root mean square length. So you've got, a, a, say you've got 100 particles, uh, but it could be any number, any finite number. And you consider all pairs of particles, you square the distance between them, and you add up all those squares, and then you take the square root of, of that big thing. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the root mean square length. So that's one length. Now another length is called the mean harmonic length. So, and that is the inverse of the Newton potential. Well, the Newton potential is, is negative, so you have to change the sign, but that's trivial. So the Newton potential is, if you have two particles of mass, of say they've got two masses, you multiply the masses and then you divide by the difference, distance between them. And you do that for all the particles. So you, again, you've got the same number of pairs of particles. You add up all pairs of particles, each pair you divide, you multiply the masses and divide by the distance between them. Uh, and then that gives you, it's not, that's not the root mean square length, but it's one upon the root mean square length. So that gives you two lengths. And then you divide the root mean square length by the mean harmonic length. And that gives you what we call the complexity. So this is actually very, very closely related. It's rather interesting, this fact. So if you just ask mathematicians to find a number which characterizes how points in space are either clustered or uniformly distributed, the thing they would come up would be what I've just defined as the complexity. Now, interestingly, the root mean square length is precisely that quantity which measures the size of the system. It's that quantity which had that U-shaped behavior that I described, the U-shaped behavior that Lagrange discovered in 1772. So that's one very important quantity in Newton's theory of gravity. 
And the other quantity, the mean harmonic length, is just one over the Newton potential from which all the Newtonian forces come. So that's very interesting that just from talking about variety, the extent to which things are clustered or uniform, you are led very naturally to the two fundamental quantities in Newton's theory of gravity. This I don't know that people have really noticed this, but I think it's very suggestive. Um, and also, one more thing about this, which is which is special. The there are forces. So the the if you have just two particles that interact with certain forces. Newton already realized that there were only two forces in nature for which you could have, when there were just two particles interacting with each other, that the orbits would be closed. So if it's Newtonian gravity, then you have elliptical orbits and they close. So two particles will keep on going around their common center of mass in elliptical orbits. That's one situation. And the other one is what's called the harmonic oscillator. And those forces are derived from the root mean square length. And there you have also, you have uh, uh, elliptical motion, but this time the, it's slightly different because the center, it's about the center. Anyway, but so this is all, there's something very, very special, I think about this number, the complexity and Newton, Newton's gravity. And it's very remarkable. I think it, it's, it's hinting at a theory of creation and something like, if you like, Spinoza's Conatus or Leibniz's striving, because you, it's almost as if the universe starts off very uniform and uninteresting, and it just goes on getting more structured and, and, and ordered. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it could be. Whether this would extend into biological things, I mean, we know in biology the growth of structure is tremendously important. I've just had to get some steroid ointment to put on, a, uh, on something on my leg where something needs attention. Uh, and uh, I checked on steroids and, and how the, the key structure in, in a steroid medical uh, thing is, is uh, 14 carbon uh, atoms arranged in a very special way. Um, and you look at that. So th these are structures of points in space. So I, I don't rule out, but it's, I would say it's still a long way away. I think that there is some chance that these ideas could go from physics, from physics of the whole universe to how biology has developed on the earth. I think it, it's not impossible. We're, we're talking about the same sort of structures. After all, the DNA molecule, which is, which is the key to the transmission of genetic information and, and life, um, that's a very special structure as well. Um, so um, there might just be the, 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 it might be, I don't know, th th that's very speculative. I don't want to claim that it, it's right. But what I do think is, is possibly of, of, of definite significance is 170 years after the problem arose, we have shown that there can definitely be a dynamical explanation of the arrow of time. We've opened up the possibility, we've given a, a rock solid mathematical result which shows that one definitely exists in Newton's theory. You don't have to add on some special condition in the past like um, Richard Feynman argued or more recently Roger Penrose argues sometimes in those directions and many other people do. Uh, so I think we've, we've definitely changed the nature of the debate. How far that, the implications I don't know, but if you've if we have a result which does have the potential to completely change what many people think is the most fundamental law in physics, namely the second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. then who knows what the knock-on effects will be, what, what, what might come out of it eventually. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you spoke about overarching law, of, uh, funda fundamental law of universe, single law, from which other localized uh, laws are derived. 
Could you explain uh, what uh, this law um, is uh, to our Yes. So, so basically, my conjecture is that the, the universe starts in the most uniform form that it can possibly have. That doesn't mean to say that it's completely blank like a, 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 a white sheet of paper. It means that the structure in it and the structure looks this, this granular structure and the granular structure is very uniform. It's the same granular structure wherever you look. Uh, and so my idea is that that's how the universe starts. It, it evolves in accordance with a definite law and that law ensures that the, the still structure but the structure gets less and less granular the structure gets bigger but rather interestingly in our newtonian model it's still the same kind of structure wherever you look um so basically uh, that sort of universe that we're modeling will look the same wherever you are that's what the it satisfies what the cosmologists call the copernican principle that the universe should look the same wherever you are so that's quite a big big step forward to, to get that far so um I, i'm so now I, sh I should say something so this the law in the newtonian model so there's a the the most fundamental dynamical law that's known is a modification of Newton's law. Newton, Newton's law, the most fundamental dynamical law is what's called Newton's law, which says that the, um, that the acceleration of bodies is proportional to the force that is acting on them. That's Newton's second law. Now, that was... Newton's second law was reformulated, uh, and then there's something called the principle of least action. I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, any of your physicist viewers will know what about the principle of least action. But in the 1820s, uh, a mathematician called 1820s and 1830 uh, called Hamilton uh, found a very beautiful way to express Newton's law, and it's called Hamiltonian dynamics. And in Hamiltonian dynamics, it automatically ensures, for example, that things like the energy and the angular momentum, which is a measure of how much rotation there is in the system, and the momentum of a system, how, how much oomph there is in it as it's traveling along through space. Um, these quantities for isolated systems, which are not subject to forces from bodies outside the system you're looking at, these are conserved quantities. They stay conserved forever. That's a famous result, which goes back to somebody called, uh, well, th that's already in, New in Hamilton's theory. And, and the connection with the principle of least action was established by a very brilliant uh, mathematician called Emmy Nurser. She proved that theorem in 1918. So, so, however, the law that I'm proposing for the universe is what's called constrained Hamiltonian dynamics. We're getting a bit technical now. What that says, it's still governed by Hamiltonian dynamics, but all those quantities, which they're conserved quantities, the energy, the angular momentum, and the momentum, they, in Hamiltonian theory, they remain constant, but in constrained Hamiltonian dynamics, the one that I'm using from the Newtonian model of the universe, they must be exactly zero. That's a very powerful constraint. So that's, they start off exactly zero. And that's, that must be in these uh, total explosion or Newtonian Big Bang solutions that I'm anticipating. But then as that the system of all those particles begins to cluster and you get the Kepler pairs and bigger groups of particles going around each other, you get subsystems, you get isolated collections of particles. So if you've got a thousand particles, you might have, uh, you'll have lots of pairs that get together, you'll have single particles going off, and then you may have three particles that are going around each other or more or things like that. And when they get separated, sufficiently separated, so there's no tidal forces acting between these separated clusters, then they behave, they obey Hamiltonian dynamics, 
and the and they do have conserved quantities. They can have all possible conserved quantities, provided all the energies add up to zero, all the angular momenta add up exactly to zero, and all the momenta add up exactly to zero. So this is the sort of the law. So this is so that what those subsystems behave, that's actually the kind of dynamics that first Newton discovered, and then nearly everybody since then has considered. So that's, that's what I call the emergence of local laws of nature. So there's a, there's a law that's governing the whole universe and says that those conserved quantities, the energy and the angular momentum, and the momentum must all be exactly zero, but then the way it works, as it as it expands outward, as the particles move further apart, these these clusters become isolated, and then they have these conserved quantities, and those are governed by what I call local laws of nature. And so, this is really what I would say. That's what Newton discovered was these local laws of nature. He had no idea, and it, Newton, for example, was absolutely amazed by. Uh, the solar system. He couldn't understand how the solar system could ever have come into existence in accordance with his own law of gravity, because he said, just look at it. All the planets go around the sun in the same way. All At that time, all the known satellites like our moon or the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn, they all go around their uh, planets in the same way as the planets go around the sun. And they're all more or less in the same plane. And he described this as this most beautiful system. And he said it was quite impossible that it could have come into existence just through the laws of nature. So Newton said, God must have set up the solar system uh, in that beautiful way. Uh, but then he noticed that his own theory would say that that beautiful order would liable to be get disrupted with time. So he then <laughs> even said that God would have to intervene and put it back in order. But what Newton didn't realize, and we point out in our papers, is that actually Newton's own theory in principle can explain how the solar system comes into order. So it's, 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 so Newton's theory is artists like William Blake hated Newton's theory because they thought it was just a theory of of clockwork, endless cogs turning uh, and, and nothing interesting happening. Well, this is very, very far from the truth. Newton's theory is a theory of creation. You start off with this, um, either this sort of swarm of bees or this very uniform state in, in the more interesting case. But in both cases, you, you start with something which is very uniform and actually there are bees uh, it's like bees swarming in different directions, flying in different directions, and then out of it, very special order comes. So, so Newton's theory is, is much, much more wonderful than Newton himself thought. Oh, it sounds uh, Parmenidian in some sense, like uh, multiplicity, uh, his uh, discussion of multiplicity and one. Or uh, would, you, would you say that? Um, I wouldn't like to say too much about Parmenides. I mean, he he's famous for saying that sort of uh, things don't change, that time doesn't exist. And my uh, in the in my first popular science book, the the, the end of time, I, I I took that very seriously. Um, I would say I'm still very Parmenidean, or better would be. Platonic about mathematics. I do think that it, it seems to me to make a lot of sense to think that there's a space of all possible triangles that you know they 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 are there. They're just there somehow in a, in a in a mathematical realm. Uh, the fact that you have these right angle triangles, three the Pythagorean right angle triangles, three, four, five, five, twelve, thirteen. That's all very wonderful. And I mean, Roger Penrose is very platonic in that way. That, that's, I mean, there are quite a lot of aspects in which I, I don't agree with, with some of the things that Roger Penrose says, but on, on the platonic aspect, I think I'm, I'm at least as platonic as him or possibly even more platonic. Um, so, uh, and I think that's rather related to the 
Parmenidean idea. And it's certainly uh, in mathematics, it's certainly related to the Platonic notion of, of forms, the, the sort of ideal things. Uh, yeah, so, so to that extent, yes, I am. Um, uh, but you are skeptical of information being uh, more fundamental than uh, matter. Uh, but uh, would you agree that like, uh, it is separate category, like matter, energy, and information? Or is it uh, emergent and derivative from matter? I so I think you're referring to an essay I wrote called so so John Wheeler talked about it from bit by it he meant some structured thing and by bit he just meant answers to yes or no questions um, and I was very skeptical about that and I still am so I reversed uh, John Wheeler's aphorism it from bit and said bit from it. Um, and I take much more a holistic view. Um, I, I, I just think when I'm looking at, at you as we're talking, or I look at my own image on the screen in front of me, I just see a, a complete picture. Um, uh, and uh, you can say, do I have one or two eyes? Well, uh, do I have two eyes? Well, the answer is yes, I can see that. And I wouldn't be able to say yes if I couldn't see my two eyes. So that's what leads me to think that in what you might call matter, I would say matter is that which gives observable structure around us that we see. Um, I think that must come first. Now, there's a beautiful theory of information uh, that was developed by Shannon during the Second World War to see how to make communications uh, faster and more reliable. Uh, and interestingly, the formula that he, divide, that he found for information is actually what um, Boltzmann had used to characterize entropy um, 60 years earlier. Um, but I still think that um, it's based on things that you can you can see around you. I, I, I'm the joint author of a paper which appeared a couple of years ago in the European Journal for Physics. Um, I have to say that my two co-authors, um, uh, Gabriele Carcassi, he's an Italian, and his American wife, Christina, and I have to confess I forget her surname. They, they were the main authors. But basically, uh, we talk about, we don't talk about Shannon information, but Shannon variability, because you, in many ways, it measures the, the variability of things. Um, uh, and you have to have, I mean, you you can think about the famous Darwin insight on the Galapagos Islands, where he came to the idea of, which was very influential in his idea of evolution, where he noticed that there were different types of finches on the different islands. So what you could, I mean, you, I mean, the sort of basic information that goes into Shannon information is how many finches of a particular type are there on one island, on another island, and so forth like that. That's the sort of raw information that goes into formulating something like Shannon information. And in fact, it's even more, uh, the way Shannon found it was just by, uh, well, it goes back to the Morse code in, in, in communication where Morse just went in, into when he won, when he was thinking of making the Morse code, he just went into a printer's shop and just looked at the, the lead type that they had in a box and saw uh, which letters uh, had the most examples. So there were far more E's uh, letters than there were X or Z. Uh, and he based his Morse code on that. And really Shannon entropy is just the same thing like that. So. It's very general because you can apply it whenever there is definite things which occur in variable quantities. So basically, Shannon information started off with 
the frequency of letters in the English language in certain typical texts. Uh, and later you could do it with the frequency of words, which he also did because that's different ways. But in all cases, there's something, I would say there's always something definite behind it. So I'm, I'm not in any slightest way diminishing the importance of information, hugely important, but I think it must, I, I believe it always has a basis in, in something that's real out there in the world. Uh, thank you very much. That was it. It was extremely interesting. Well, pleasure to talk to you, Zaza.